Hello, I'm Hannah Kay, and welcome to this Intelligence Squared debate, Cats versus Dogs. Now, this event has been a long time in the making because although I always knew that Will Self was my dog man and I've always found him quite obedient, I didn't have someone with the intellectual heft to defend cats until a few weeks ago when Penguin Press flagged up to me this wonderful new book, Feline Philosophy by John Gray. And there's absolutely no doubt about John's intellectual abilities. So we had a debate and I'm so happy it's happening tonight. Now you can get a discounted copy of Feline Philosophy if you click through the link that we're going to be posting in a minute in the audience chat. There are various ways in which you can get engaged tonight. Of course you can vote at the beginning and then again at the end of the debate. You can ask questions, join in the audience chat and tweet using the hashtag IQ2. We've got two events coming up next week. We have the psychologist and broadcaster Claudia Hammond, and she's going to be talking about the art of rest, something that I think most of us need to hear at the end of this tumultuous year. And then very excitingly, we have Daniel Goldman. He's the author of the massive bestseller, Emotional Intelligence, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary. And Goldman's talk for us in 2013 has generated over 3 million YouTube views. So this really isn't one to miss. Finally, if you're stuck for a Christmas present for someone who's perhaps a bit bored in lockdown, you might want to think about one of our gift subscriptions or one of our gift cards, which can be used in exchange for our events, masterclasses and courses. Now, finally, I'm going to hand over to our chair. She is a cultural historian and broadcaster, Shahida Bari. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Hello and welcome to this Intelligence Squared online debate, cats versus dogs. It's the issue that's more divisive than Brexit, more polarising than politics. Uh, in today's debate, we'll be fighting like, yes, cats and dogs in the battle of a household pet. Who will triumph, Fido or Felix? We'll find out over the course of the next hour. First of all, though, let's find out what you think as we take our starting vote. You should be able to see a slide appearing on your screen right now inviting you to vote in this uh, and let me not understate the case the single most important referendum in recent memory uh, so please vote cats or dogs and if you are unsure or perhaps prefer a hamster you can opt to vote undecided I'll give you a moment to do that um, this is of course our first vote and we'll compare the results of this vote against the final vote at the end of the debate to see if our debaters have got under your skin and while we wait for these results to be calculated let me tell you about our theme cats versus dogs it's a rather broad one so who knows how our debaters will take it will they make the case for the superiority of one species over another in any number of ways. Are cats more beautiful? Are dogs more intelligent? Should a cat or dog be the next bond? Uh, just before I hand over to them, let me explain how this evening will work. In a moment, our two debaters will make their opening speeches. Then you'll have a chance to interrogate them too with your questions. And at 6.55, London time, approximately 50 minutes time, the speakers will make their short closing statement. And then I'll invite you, our audience, to cast your final vote, uh, the result of which we'll declare at 7 p.m. Uh, do feel free to start posing your questions now. You can simply type your question in the box under your screen. And if you don't wish to be named, then you can click on anonymous uh, and don't forget to press send. A reminder to you that you can also tweet as we go along using the hashtag IQ2. Now, uh, let me share the result of the vote from a moment ago. And I can reveal that uh, the vote has come back as 34% for cats and 48% for dogs with an undecided or for hamster vote, 17%. So that's a, a fairly decisive win for the dogs. Um, but let's see if uh, John can make a difference to the standings um, right now. So um, 
Let me tell you about our speakers. Speaking up for dogs, we have the novelist, broadcaster and commentator Will Self. He's the writer of the recent trilogy Umbrella, Shark and Phone and a memoir titled Will in 2019. He's also the writer of an infamous LRB article where his dog discovered a lurid sex toy while being walked on Clapham Common, if I recall, Will. So I think he'll have lots to say. And then speaking up for cats, one of our most popular political philosophers, John Gray. John's books include Straw Dogs, uh, The Silence of Animals, and Seven Types of Atheism. And his latest book, as Hannah described, Feline Philosophy, Cats and the Meaning of Life, has been called by the observer, The Intellectual Cat's Pajamas. Now, Will and John will have 10 minutes. If either of you run over, you'll hear, hear a, a pertinent sound encouraging you to rapidly perorate. Um, so let's start. Let's hand over, first of all, to Will on behalf of dogs. Thank you, Shahida. 17% um, is a lot to play for undecided. And, and with 48%, you might think I'm well ahead of John here and that, you know, it, it behooves me with my kind of doggish nature to give ground immediately. You know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm strongly invested in a fight flight mechanism and I already feel myself retreating here. Uh, you know, and, and what I want to say at the outset is I bear no animosity towards the cat fraternity at all, to humans who, who, who favor cats or to cats who favor humans or any of that. I don't really want this to be a kind of, uh, and I think the, 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 the idiom is appropriate, a pissing contest of any kind <laughs> at all. Uh, to be blunt, I, I, I consider John a, a dear and, and uh, old friend now. We've known each other for, we first met nearly 20 years ago, and I am a, a great admirer of his work, not least this book, which I, I think is utterly stimulating and a, and a delight to read. And moreover, you know, I've had, I've, I've lived with cats myself and, and, and been very close to them. So I, I'm really just not interested in going in that direction. Nor may I say, am I interested in what we might call the anthropomorphic direction, which is to take the question from solely the point of view of the human being and talk within that experience of uh, you know, I think we need to talk in terms of, uh, uh, of what uh, Jacob von Wexkuhl, the great founder of animal ethology, called the life world, the Lebenswelt of the creature, and, and not prejudice uh, the view, for example, with our human capabilities of investing just about anything in our environment with the possibility of being sentient the way we are. You know, I think of, of um, I'm waving a, an ancient hand axe in front of the camera <laughs> because I think if I wave, you know, if this hand axe sort of noses into the camera view and then noses out again and then comes back and perhaps it nuzzles against my face, <laughs> people out there are going to start thinking it's sentient. That it, that it has a form of, of consciousness and that they, they could probably start trying to predict where it's coming from, because that's what humans do. You don't need to be a disciple of Simon Baron Cohen and his views about theory of mind in autists not to understand that we, we will do this willy nilly. We will anthropomorphize and we will project onto anything in our environment the possibility of sentience. So I don't really want to go down that route either. Uh, I don't want to kind of, as I say, indulge in a pissing context, but if John is going to try any sort of speciesism of any kind at all, including any arguments that strongly favour cats over dogs, I, I, I would have to rub his nose in it like a naughty philosophic <laughs> puppy, because the, the fact of the matter is he himself argues very strongly against even the concept of species, certainly when it applies to humans, and I, I, I don't see why uh, cats should be, or, or dogs should be exempt for this either. It's a very porous barrier, the species barrier. So, you know, we don't want to commit the, the sin, the, the, the dual sin of speciesism and anthropocentrism. So we're not, we're not going to go there. All right. I am not strictly speaking, I have to say, a dog lover at all. Uh, lots of dogs I, I really don't like. Uh, I don't want to go anywhere. What I am is a, uh, 
my dog lover and he's actually curled up on the bed right behind me and it, it puts me in mind of a conversation i had quite recently with a man called stephen whittle who founded the uh the pressure group press for change that fought long and hard to get transgender people recognized uh in britain legally uh, as the the gender they wished to be and I, I had dinner with Stephen. I did a book with him back in the 1990s when I was interested in transgender. And, I, and we talked a lot about those issues of, you know, what we think we are. And I, I had dinner with him two or three years ago. And he said, I, I no longer think in, in gender terms at all. I think of myself as a Stephen primarily. That's who I am. Uh, and so I'm a McGlorian lover in the same tune. My, my dog is called McGlorian. He was named by my third son after McGorian, a centaur in the, in the magic forest next to Hogwarts. Yes, I have suffered <laughs> for, for J.K. Rowling's many millions. Um, he thought that was too gory, so he called the dog McGlorian. And, uh, you know, I... I had a bad relationship in a sense with dogs as a child. The, the, the dog in our, our family was the, the unhappy center of an unhappy family. And the woman I was sent to, to who really brought me up because my parents you know, weren't up for the job a lot of the time, happened to be a dog obedience trainer. And I grew up literally with a dog that placed second at Crufts in the obedience class. So a dog of, considerable intelligence in in human terms kate this alsatian dog could perform i kid you not anything up to 10 tasks in sequence that could be given to her verbally uh, and it was an extraordinary sight but here's the key point about dogs dogs have an adaptive advantage if they get on with humans and humans have an adaptive advantage if they get on with dogs. Basically, we are in true symbiosis as species. We have genetically altered in order to be with each other. This is not true of humans and cats. And that's the most salient thing. If there's gonna be any argument, if you win, lose, we have to address this fact. Uh, you know, my, my late wife put it quite well when she said, um, Dogs love us more than they love each other, and we love each other more than, uh, and we love dogs more than we love each other as well. And I'm not saying that's true. I don't think it is true. But the, the level and depth of affinity between humans and canines, what we loosely call humans and canines, cannot be gainsaid. Uh, ask yourselves, even you fanatical cat lovers out there, touching a dog's body feels completely natural. They do not feel odd to us dogs. They never have felt odd. In, in many traditional societies, uh, hold on to your hats, everyone. It is commonplace for young women to suckle puppies, to breastfeed puppies. This is not considered a weird or a strange thing at all. Uh, this is because of the selection pressure that we both share. So what are we to make of this in terms of humans and in terms of dogs and in terms of cats. John's brilliant book makes it clear that cats were never domesticated. They, if they live with us at all, they do it by choice, or we, what we imagine to be choice of some form. They seem to live alongside us. They are not engaged with us in that way. John uses the cat, and I think beautifully, as a symbol of a kind of non-human intelligence, a non-human life world that we do well to revere in a sense and to understand in a way as a portal to perhaps a biophilia, a love of the natural world that our human society represses a lot of the time. And I think that is, you know, and I don't mean this in a cheesy way, I think that's a beautiful thought, John, and, and I can go with you in that thought a long way. But dogs tell us who we really are. And the truth of the matter is we're bounded by this society. We're bounded by this culture. And, and if you'll forgive the doggish idiom, we're in deep shit. And, <laughs> and the symbiosis of human and dog, the useless symbiosis of human and dog, that, that has us going round the corner here in the Oval South London to the Hound Hut, 
to buy special biltong for McGlorian that has me <laughs> buying him a little uh, Fair Isle jumper from Diamond Dogs in Bermondsey for £55 that sees me lavish care and attention on him that, frankly, he probably neither wants nor cares about. That, too, is a symbol of the shit we're in. Yes, we dogs and humans are embracing each other as we rocket towards the inevitable catastrophe. And indeed, the fact that our only access to the natural world is through a creature who we've domesticated to the extent that we've bred it into being a ridiculous little pygmy wearing a fair isle sweater is just proof of that fact. So I ask you to support dogs because they're in it with us. You know, basically, if you keel over, your cat will eat your face immediately. But a dog will wait about half an hour <laughs> until it's absolutely sure that civilization's going too. And that's the basis on which I want you to vote emphatically for dogs. Marvellous. Thank Marvellous. you so much, Will. You were so uh, impudent that you were on time and I didn't get a chance to play uh, my... Um... <laughs> My cue to tell you to stop talking, but wonderful. Um, and Simon in the chat has already um, uh, cat whistled, I guess, cat called you. Let's see this so-called dog then, Will. And if your dog really is chewing biltong and wearing a fair owl jumper, then I think Simon speaks for all of us. Um, <laughs> while Will uh, grabs his dog, uh, let me uh, hand over to John uh, and we'll find out whether Will is barking mad. There's my glory and brilliant. <laughs> Our third, <laughs> Jack Russell, uh, the uh, most aggressive dog breed there is, bar none. Wow, yeah. <laughs> um, a bracing account there from Will, but is he barking mad? Uh, let's hear the counter case for cats from John Gray. Well, the counter case, thank you, Will, for all the nice things you said about my book and for your defense of dogs against cats. And it's the only possible defense, as well as the most compelling defense, to say, um, Dogs are better than cats because they're happy to be in the shit with us most of the time. I mean, until the point where we expire and it's clear that civilization is really <clears throat> gone, <clears throat> they'll, they'll wallow in the same shit with every delight of which uh, they're, they're capable. Cats here are different. And um, this is perhaps one of the reasons why I think there have been far many cat haters in human history than there have been dog haters. There have been whole anti-feline cats, uh, uh, cat movements in Europe, uh, particularly in the period of um, early modern modernity and late medievalism. Uh, right from the start of Christianity, cats were singled out as uh, untrustworthy, uh, somewhat evil creatures. Uh, whereas I don't think that's been the case for dogs. And the fundamental difference between cats and dogs in their relations with humans is the one you mentioned, Will, which is that um, dogs have been, so to speak, in the form in which, forms in which we live with them, created or invented or fashioned by humans as their companions. We share so much of them. Whereas cats, first of all, elected to live with humans, I think, for what might be described as their own uh, reasons. And their DNA, though it's changed, though there are many breeds that have been even overbred, hasn't changed so much that their nature has assimilated to what might be called human nature or the human mind. They remain very, very different from us. Now, one other uh, point that I fully share with you, Will, is that um, we shouldn't rank um, uh, animals, including the human animal, in any cosmic hierarchy. Uh, that's partly a moral thing. I think it's rather solipsistic and narcissistic and slightly shitty, if you, if, if you like. Mm -hmm. But it's also true, unless you're some kind of disciple of Plato or some kind of monotheist, that there's no great chain of being. What the, what the, what the medievals and early moderns thought of was a kind of cosmic hierarchy in which we all fit. There isn't. There are just different uh, animals. Uh, with very porous boundaries, even between the different species of these animals, as you point out. In the end, I follow Spinoza in this, there are only actually individuals um, which happen to have um, some kinships with 
um, other animals uh, that uh, are like them. Um, and so that is true. So on what ground could I then argue for the superiority of cats over dogs? They're not, so to speak, metaphysically superior. They can't be, there's no uh, great chain of being. But I think they give us something my basic argument is that cats give us something because they're so different from us that other human beings or dogs, which are part human in their very souls, I think other sentient species have souls. Uh, uh, that's to say parts of themselves they don't understand, parts of themselves they'll never understand. And that the dog soul is closer to the human soul than the feline uh, soul is Close, is, is, is closer to the human soul or the dog soul. So what is it that they can give us? Well, it's precisely this window into another world, a world larger than the human world. Now, it may be, Will, and I often think that this is the case, and I know you often think it's the case even more than I do, that we can't get out of this increasingly shitty human world. The only way of getting out of it is that the whole bloody thing perishes in some vast cosmic diarrhea or, uh, uh, of, of some kind. That may be the case. Um, I'm not yet ready to make a judgment on it, whether I can't make a judgment on it. There's still too much uncertainty. But we can see out of it as individuals. We can look out of it and we can get strength and beauty and uh, a certain kind of uh, life affirmation, if you like, affirmation of life itself by looking out of this um, shitty human world. Um, and that's what cats give us. Cats are a kind of biophiliac icon. They're an icon through which we look out at the vast world, which still exists despite all the mass extinctions that are going on, human created, which is still there and will, in my view, survive us. Because one of the worst anthropocentrisms is the idea that humans are going to save the planet or that they can even destroy it. They can do enormous, colossal damage to other forms of life. But the Earth is vastly older, vastly stronger, vastly more resilient than um, uh, we humans tend to think. And it will emerge in some other wholly different form when we are long gone, long vanished. And so it's, it's, in a sense, the difference from cats, the remoteness of cats from us, that makes us, those who love cats, love them because they're so different from us. Love them, be, uh, even though we know they don't love us back in the way that we love them or that we love other human beings, uh, um, we know that they may have a kind. They may have a, a kind of love for us. I think their relation to us is not purely instrumental in the sense of being based on food. I mean, the common idea that they cats love us because, or like to be with us, enter our households, for covered love, because we feed them. Um, I think it's falsified by many instances because uh, cats will eat what they're given if it's uh, pleasant to them, but if they really dislike the person who gives the human being that provides the food, they'll find another home pretty quickly. They'll move on and find, they'll hunt outside or they'll move to one or other homes. And this, by the way, is a, a fundamental difference between dogs. Uh, Hannah and I were talking about this the other day. I don't think there's any recorded case, I may be wrong about this, of dogs wandering off and adopting another household. Certainly not two or three, which cats quite regularly do. Uh, so the paradox of feline love, the love that cats have for us, I think, is that they may come to value us as companions, even though they don't need us. If they stop needing us, or if they stop liking us, they're off. And so every moment you spend with a cat is in that sense, a gift of the cat from the cat to you and it makes it kind of special. They're not loyal to us in the way that dogs are. They don't have the human virtue, quite rare, I think, of loyalty, um, uh, 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 they don't even pretend to have that. They are what they are. They assert their natures as the cats they are. They affirm their natures, they enjoy life. Uh, but part of that can be with, uh, be with, uh, involve being with a, a human being. And one of the writers um, I love, I like the most, as well as uh, your books, Will, is a more a recent writer that I've only come across in the last, um, uh, year actually or so, until, just before I wrote the book actually, is Mary Gateskill, the American, uh, a brilliant, original, highly original writer, who wrote a, a memoir, which has now appeared separately as a little book called Lost Cat, which is about uh, her adopting a cat 
uh, a small one-eyed frail little cat but an intrepid cat and she felt she came to believe a loving cat who she lost and the experience lost irretrievably uh, uh, and the experience which sort of unraveled her mind in many ways led uh, uh, she thought unlocked many of her relationships with other humans with her father who she'd had a very conflicted relationship he died of cancer partly because he wouldn't take treatment she was unable to communicate them she had difficult relations with the children she'd adopted um, uh, with her partner uh, uh, and with humans in general and she had, in this book attributes to this short relationship less than a year with a tiny little cat uh, a, a capacity to undo uh, unknot untie many of these um, knotted contradictions that she felt it attended her love for other humans and human love in generally that's to say um, loving someone when you don't want to love them might lead you to hate yourself for loving them. Someone loving you who you don't love might lead you to feel that their love is a burden uh, and an intrusion on you. All these uh, some human loves express a desire for power over the person who is loved or not loved. All of this she thinks is lacking in feline love. Not that it means we should therefore confine ourselves to feline love. What she writes about in this wonderful little book is how this short, abrupt, and from her point of view, tragic relationship, nonetheless unlocked her capacity to feel love for other people, in a, other human beings in a way she didn't feel before. So um, uh, I think only a creature as different from us perhaps could give us that. Maybe there are some people who have had similar experience with dogs, but it's the very difference of cats from us, um, which makes them so beloved uh, to those um, who, who love them. So what I'm arguing for is not the superiority of cats over dogs. Cats are cats, dogs are dogs, humans are humans. Um, and each individual cat, dog and human is what it is. And the most fundamental fact of all, as you say, is that, is, is that of this kind of individuality. Um, but it's also true, and here I'll con happily concede something to you, that we differ from cats profoundly and that we I mean, one of the reasons we're in this shit is that we need to be with humans in a certain kind of solidarity that cats don't need. I mean, male cats don't uh, uh, look after their kittens. Female cats will die for their kittens uh, to protect them, but male cats don't. And they're solitary hunters. They're solitary predators. So they're not like us. They're utterly different. Humans need to form packs congregations. Uh, uh, they need to form um, communities in a way that cats don't. And that's essential to us. And that gives us many of the, many of the, got it, got it. Just a gentle key. Uh, got it. Uh, so, um, and that's a valuable feature of humans. We don't want to become so feline that we lose the valuable uh, attributes of being human. But we can do with an admixture of non-humanness if we are to be happier as human beings. And um, I think that's uh, something illustrated in Gateskill's great book. And that's why I urge you all um, to, uh, whether I urge you all to uh, vote for cats uh, over dogs, because unlike dogs, they give us something that's not human and that enriches and even liberates our humanity. Thank you so much, John, passionately advocating there for pussycats. We'll head to audience questions in a moment, but I'm going to encourage you, our audience, to start sending them to us now. So you can type your question in the box under your screen. If you don't wish to be named, click on anonymous and don't forget to press send. And a reminder to you that you can tweet whether catty remarks or a fond pat on the head using the hashtag IQ2. Now, while you're busy doing that, let me interrogate our debaters a little more. Uh, well, I've got a question question for you. I wonder what you think of John's argument about what I take to be the volition of cats. Cats have elected to live with humans and that act of volition, their ability to act, uh, make a decision, um, that makes their company a greater gift to us. What do you think, Will? Well, I, I think it's pretty flimsy as an argument <laughs> is the problem. It's it's based on not a lot of empirical evidence and, su and such empirical evidence that there is, is I'm afraid highly tendentious. Uh, at any rate, even if the argument does have some purchase, I, I think you could make the case 
oddly enough, you can certainly make the case, you know, dogs may share, uh, you know, so we may be in a symbiosis with them, but, but particularly since we ceased working with them in a meaningful way, it's questionable how driven towards our practice and our being in the world that symbiosis is. Uh, it's much more likely for most people, it's an emotional symbiosis, as I was saying, it's about a love object or a love person. I mean, I, I, we can get into that, but I definitely think of McLaurin as a person. Uh, and, I, and McLaurin is, is very other to me. I mean, he's, he's uh, close enough to me that I consider him as one of my fifth child, in a sense. <laughs> he fits into that. And, and I, I, I think there's something very moving as well. And I've, I've spoken with John about this before, about, you know, you know, John has this marvelous thing in the book where he sort of reflects on this idea that, you know, of course, the Egyptians worshipped cats, that maybe, you know, there's something godlike in, in the way that we look towards cats. But I also think for our domesticated animals, they must, particularly for dogs, there must be something godlike about us. Uh, and I think that kind of hands the baton of responsibility back in an appropriate way, you know, because McLaurin. You know, McLaurin is looking around him now. He's he's got very bad arthritis. He needs a lot of medication. He's not that old for Jack, but he's not. I think he's in his old age now, and he must be looking at me and thinking, "Hang on a minute. He was middle aged when I arrived, and he's <laughs> still middle aged now. What's going on?" You know. So I think there's there's something there, and I think that dogs offer us just the same portal to biophilia that John claims for cats. And I think that, that where I think John's argument falls down most clearly, and, and, I, and I'm touched that he is in a sense came to join my argument, mm. is on this business of our, our relationship overall with what we insist on calling the natural world, but which is really just the world. And it made me think of a great science fiction story. I can't remember the writer. I'm just going to match literary texts with him called, I think it's called um, A Dog and His Boy. Uh, and it's a post-apocalyptic story. And it's basically about a boy that hunts with a genetically enhanced super intelligent dog that he's telepathic with. But of course, it's not really science fiction. Dogs are telepathic with humans when it comes to hunting behavior, when they, they work together. Uh, anyway, the, the boy has a kind of affair with a young woman he finds uh, in the wreckage of this post-apocalyptic wreckage. And, you know, plot spoiler, in the end, he feeds the girl to the dog not the dog to the girl. And <laughs> that's why it's called a dog and his boy, I suppose. And, and the point about this is to press forward with my argument. Yes, I don't know how severe, uh, what, how severe the impact of this mass extinction event and the associated climate emergency is really going to be on human society in the future. But I know for one thing's for sure, if we do make it through what Stephen Hawking memorably described as this pinch point. I want to have a dog <laughs> <laughs> to hunt in the post-apocalyptic ruins, yeah. not a pussycat. <laughs> <laughs> John, John, what do you what do you think? Will Will was a little bit catty there about your argument, but I wonder what you think of <laughs> Will's argument that um, that dogs have an adaptive advantage if they get on with humans, because we know that cats are not leading the blind, they're not sniffing out drugs, they're not detecting mm. cancers. Does the usefulness, the inherent usefulness of dogs, even at the end of the world as Will is imagining it, mean that your pay end to pussy cats will always come short? Well, it's it's even more. Uh, they're, cats are even more useless in practical terms than you say because they don't they're not even terribly interested in pest control there's quite a lot of uh, evidence that they just watch mice and see how they behave but unless they have unless there's some clear benefit to them in in hunting the mice they're indifferent to it uh, uh, and they don't do it when they're not watched uh, a lot of the time either uh, so um that's perfectly uh, true. Uh, but that increases the, uh, to my mind, the, the value of cats to humans. And it makes it clear that the value of humans to cats is not in their practical usefulness. So the fact whether or not they give us some kind of comparative survival advantage is 
neither here nor there. Uh, I mean, to me, in a way, I mean, I turn the Will's question around the other way. Supposing we, I suppose by we, he means we humans, don't get through this, uh, um, this huge combination of climate emergency and mass extinction. We're among the uh, uh, creatures that don't. To me, it's a source of um, life-affirming joy to think that the world will still contain cats most likely, because there'll be parts of the world probably that are inhospitable to humans, uh, like the upper reaches of the Himalayas, but which do contain cats of a kind, which the upper reaches of the Himalayas also do. Um, so uh, um, to me, uh, th they have this, um, their very beauty, their very uh, uselessness, if you like, or very not limited uh, practical uses um, adds to their uh, uh, adds to their uh, to their to their value, and so uh, that's why I kind of um, insist on this idea that their value to us doesn't depend upon anything practical. It doesn't. It isn't. It isn't that they give us any comparative advantage. They don't give us any comparative advantage at all in the struggle for survival, but they give us um, perhaps a degree of um, uh, consolation if we're not going to survive. Yeah. I have a lot of time for a defense of useless things thinking of myself here. But let me <laughs> let me turn to the the audience. We I can tell you we've got some terrific questions and if you haven't yet asked uh, a question had your say on the matter please feel free to do that. You can uh, 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 type in your question in the box and remember to send it to us. Um let's start with with this question. Um I, I like cats more but I'm concerned about their effect on the wild bird population. What do you mm. think about this? Well, I talk about that in my book a bit. Uh, there are ways of dealing with this practically. They can bells can be attached to them. You can you can pursue policies which limit that uh, 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 impact. Uh, it's also true, by the way, though, that birds can be harmful. They're more likely to spread contagious diseases than cats. Um, all uh, uh, most animals have this feature. And the big thing I think, the big thing beyond this is which species, let's use the language of species just for a moment, is most responsible for mass extinction. It's not cats or dogs or birds. It's the one we belong to, however porous it is. So I think that's what we should be focusing on. But I take the seriousness of the question. The question is serious, but one can adopt this, put a bell on it, cats get used to it. They still enjoy uh, trying to capture birds, but they do so much less frequently when a bell alerts the bird. to. <laughs> Will, is uh, Maglorian a predator? Maglorian, being a Jack Russell, of course, is bred as a ratter. His job is to keep the rat population down in, in farmyards traditionally or in fox hunting, which is a completely, is as, about as useless to humans as cats. Mm. Um, <laughs> the fox, is, as Oliver Rackham, the great historian of the English countryside, puts it, the fox would have been extinct by the Tudor era if people didn't enjoy hunting it. Um, so they're kept artificially alive, whatever the hunting lobby tell you, in order that they can hunt them. And incidentally, they're still doing it. That drag racing is just a blind. Um, so McGlorian would be put down the set, would be carried on the, the huntsman's saddle and then would be put into the set to, to drag the fox out and then it would be dispatched. So in true dog fashion, he acts as the, the hitman for the human hierarchy. And, and, and uh, you know, one thing we, we need to recognise about how closely intertwined we are is, you know, so in traditional societies, in Australian Aboriginal society, dogs have their own dreaming dogs' lineages are, are accounted for. They have their own totems. Uh, they have a, a complete interlinkage with, with human cultural knowledge in that way. No, McLaurin's never hunted or killed anything in his life. He's notably pathetic in that <laughs> way. And, and, and I was never seriously arguing, even in a post-apocalyptic situation, for the profound utility of dogs. I'm not arguing for them as therapy dogs. I'm not arguing for them as objects of of slavish affection in that way at all. That's not my argument. My argument is quite simply that we really, really are in it together. Yeah. And, you know, yes, 
John is perfectly free to project a future in which cats, you know, sort of dominate the earth and everything's sort of beautiful. And that you, you could just, it would be beautiful, a planet of cats sunning themselves in the, <laughs> in, in the vast red dwarf that's about to supernova. But <laughs> shout out for dogs as well. Bear in mind, in every situation in which you get uh, social collapse, meaningful social collapse, very quickly, you see charming packs of mixed former pet dogs hunting together, poodles and chihuahuas mm. alike, bringing down game. I find that very reassuring. I, I don't think in, in my in my urge to associate dogs with humans at this very profound organic level, I also wish to allow them their autonomy. Mm. And I and I think they are perfectly capable of knowing, uh, if you'll forgive the, the, the continued scatological idioms, when the <laughs> shit really has hit the fan. <laughs> and I mentioned one, one climate scientist said to me, look, it won't be all bad. The polar bears will become brown bears. Mm. Oh. Well, they already are, of course, yeah. because yeah. Their, their, their fur is, in fact, transparent. Yes, you know? yes, yeah, but they'll become visibly brown. Yeah. Let me, let me, well, that sounds like episode two about um, polar bears versus other bears, bears. but let me um, ask you this question, which I think is actually a very deep one, actually. Did they domesticate us or did we domesticate them? And I think that applies to both cats and dogs. And that's a question really about power. Who's in charge? Our cats, our dogs or us? Well, if I could just jump in there, uh, I, there's no evidence that cats have done anything that sort of chip up. They're not domesticated, effectively. I'm not going to argue that. And I think that, you know, I'll give them a mark for that. That's impressive. Marvellous book came out last year called uh, Against the Grain on domestication in early Mesopotamian civilizations. And, and the author, whose name has just slipped my mind annoyingly for a minute, I think it's James Scott or something, he's the doyen of the subject, points out that almost every domesticated species that's been domesticated by humans is about a third less intelligent than its wild conspecifics and considerably more docile and herd-like. He calls it, he calls these Mesopotamian civilizations uh, late Neolithic species resettlement camps, uh, <laughs> and which I think is a marvelous phrase. And it captures the subtext of the entire book, though he never, of course, states it explicitly because it's too subversive, which is, of course, not only did we, uh, you know, uh, domesticate other animals, we domesticated ourselves, or rather, this was a collective event. Mm. And, and I'm sorry, domesticated humans are probably a third stupider than their wild <laughs> conspecifics. <laughs> and certainly a great deal more docile as recent events have, have proved yet again. John? And oddly enough, humans, or perhaps naturally enough, dream less well than their pre-domesticated. Mm. Oh, wow. Comparing mm. them with uh, the Australian indigenous peoples, for mm -hmm. example, yeah. dream less interestingly. Dreams are much larger part of the life of so called pre civilized or prehistoric uh, species. No, I mean, I, 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 uh, I don't think we're very far away from each other uh, on, 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 on this point. I, I wonder if you can answer this next question, which I warn you is a little bit personal. And if you feel bashful, that's mm. absolutely fine. Um, where do you both stand on kissing your cat or dog? Too anthropomorphic? I never did. Even uh, That's all I can tell you. I mean, maybe <laughs> we rubbed noses. Cats like to rub noses if they trust you, if they like you. They don't do it for long and they turn away pretty quickly, <laughs> but they do do it and they do seem to enjoy it. They don't resist it being, uh, it being done. Uh, uh, but uh, I've never, I'd, if, if by kiss you mean mouth to mouth, I've never done it. Well, yes. Well, I mean, I, I, I have to paraphrase uh, Martin Amos's uh, brilliant episode about sibling in about how, why, um, uh, sex in long married couples is like sibling incest. Uh, it happens remarkably infrequently, and when it does, is attended with great shame by both <laughs> parties. Uh, which is all by way of saying that I have great shame in this matter. And, and uh, the marvelous book by J.R. Ackley um, mm. about his dog, uh, my dog Tulip. Mm. 
he gets pretty close to admitting to having a sexual relationship with the dog. Pretty close. Well, in fact, wow. he does admit it. Uh, I've certainly met people who have had sexual relationships with dogs. Uh, I've had a, a rich and full life. And as I to go back to what I said <laughs> at the beginning, I'm not surprised. I mean, it doesn't float my boat. It's hard to imagine the dog could consent. Mm. Uh, meaningfully, which would make me worried ethically. Mm. Mm. But that being noted, you know, there's a, there's a good old uh, American country blues band back in the, in, in the 1960s uh, called Three Dog Night. Uh, well, every every night for McGlorian is a two human night. He covers himself with the bodies of the two humans he sleeps with, and and the way he kind of. And as I say, I feel no uh, kind of let or hindrance to cuddling him or having the kind of intimacy with him including kissing him that I would have with any of my other children it would not occur to me to feel awkward or strange about that and it's not to do with being anthropomorphic mm. it's to do with the fact that he's a dog and and it's natural mm. in as much as anything is natural mm. for us to kiss dogs mm. it's not a problem Great to have you be so confessional. Um, this is a question from Shay. Uh, I've had an argument that the cats versus dogs debate is less about their qualities, but really about our own human personalities in that we each have an instinctive affinity for one or the other. So my question is, do you feel that you can tell whether someone you know is a dog person or a cat person before they confirm one way or another? I can't, I can't always tell. Um, for one thing, if you're feline in your behavior, you might not reveal. <laughs> Cats reveal what they want to reveal. Uh, this is, by the way, related to something else whereby if uh, I noticed someone flashed up a question, which I thought was a very uh, uh, interesting question, that there's a special joy in communicating with a cat because it's so difficult most of the time. I mean, on the one hand, they're very explicit about what they want. They're in no way inscrutable or impenetrable. If they want their breakfast, they'll tell you relentlessly until they get some satisfaction. And if they don't, they'll push off somewhere. Uh, um, but on the other hand, it's hard to, uh, for them to communicate uh, to us in the way that dogs can. If you look, I look into a dog's eye, you can see them looking directly back at you and interacting through hardly ever happens with cats because if you look in a cat's eye, it's it's programmed evolutionarily to see that as a threat. So you have to be kind of indirect. But when you can from time to time, and I've had this experience, when they when they want to communicate something to you, it's even more um, it's even more in a sense precious coming from beyond the human world. It's almost like it is like an alien species communicating. And the communication is normally friendly if you've had a long friendly um, uh, relationship with me. Just rephrase your question, Shahida, uh, the one you started with. It was uh, it's about whether we know whether a, a cat person is a cat person or a dog person, if there is anything. Well, I think I, I can't tell. I mean, I think that's a, that's, that's a, a stereotype which doesn't really, well, first of all, lot, lots of people like both. Some people don't like either. Yeah. Uh, they prefer birds, for example, some people. Uh, um, I can't really tell uh, um, unless I know the person rather well. Well, we could test it because neither you nor Will know me very well. I wonder what you think I am. Can you tell? I would say you're a cat person. Will? Um, Look deep into I've, my eyes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I suspect you may come from a Muslim background by Ooh. your name. Oh, so this is a real detective work, Will. Uh, in which case, while it's absolutely not true that people who, uh, you know, in the several cultures that make up the Muslim world are absolutely opposed to dogs, nonetheless, I believe, you can, uh, if, if somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, that they are considered to be haram. In other words, you don't have them in the home. Uh, it's you don't keep dogs in the home. So if you do come from a Muslim background, I suspect that you might be more likely to be a cat person, but only by culture uh, acculturation. I will, I will reveal all later. Um, <laughs> but let me ask you some more questions. And I'm going to encourage our audience to keep asking these questions because they are they are they are excellent. Um, uh, I'll ask this question. Uh, cats have a whole range of meows to let us know whether they want something. Dogs only have a bark. Does that not make cats superior? Maybe this is about animals and language. Is there a distinction here between our cats and our dogs? 
Uh, I mean, I, if I can jump in there, I mean, one, that's just not true. Dogs have lots of different kinds of what we have to call vocalizations as well. And in fact, you know, the dog just now is kind of whining away, wanting to, me to let him out of the room. So the, the, they've got lots of different vocalizations. Uh, this question of communication, because I think John has been quite eloquent there and saying it's the very kind of difficulty and the struggle. You know, he was slightly kind of adding to Wittgenstein's famous episode mm. that if a lion could speak, we wouldn't be able to understand mm. what he said. And, and I, I'm with, with John and contra Wittgenstein yes. and the analytic philosophers. I think that's absolute nonsense. Me too. Of course, if a lion could speak, we very much would understand what he was saying, <laughs> because otherwise it wouldn't be speaking. It's a sort yeah. of meaningless yeah. statement in the yeah. first place. And anyway, I think there is a lot of interspecific communication. Yeah. And I, despite the impact of Saussurean linguistics on our philosophic thinking, I do not think that all thought is language at all. Absolutely uh, not. In quite that way. And it's, and, yeah. and, and, or even semiotic in quite that way. Mm. I think there is room for sub language, imagistic communication, effective forms of communication, all of that. I think that the, the advantage that the dog definitely has over the cat is the communicative one, though. And, as, mm. and against John's point that, you know, you, you feel a sense of victory when you've managed to communicate with your cat. Uh, I have to say that the uh, ease and fluidity of the communication with the dog, especially emotional communication, mm. is part of what makes the relationship so attractive. And listen, I never wanted to go to this place, and it's certainly not my point, and I wouldn't want to win the argument. Mm. No. Oh, well, you slightly cut out. Are you back? Sorry. Are you back? Most, You're back? I th at least in, in, in cognitive terms, as humans understand mm. it, mm. Uh, dogs are way smarter than cats. They just are. Mm. I'm sorry. They just are. And, and in terms of, therefore, the ability... You've cut out again, Will. Oh, sorry. I, I don't know what to do about it. But you, you, no, you're you, right you, now. You're I think right we, now. I think we got your, right your, your point was about cats being um, intellectually, perhaps intellectually winning the argument. And perhaps I can pick up on the, the philosophy. We've talked about Wittgenstein. Um, John, your book, of course, is called Feline Philosophy. And uh, you begin mm. with an epigraph or the, the, the very famous cat paradox from Montaigne, mm. uh, whether is, is my cat playing with me or am I playing with mm. my cat? And Montaigne can't work out. And so that's repeated by Derrida, actually, a mm. few years ago when he undresses in front of his cat and realizes that he is naked next to his naked cat. So are, the, the cats are in the philosophy does this mean that are dogs not intellectual or do dogs have a place in philosophy well this i mean the person who wrote jr ackley who wrote that wonderful book about his love his love relationship with his dog uh queenie wasn't it uh um uh wasn't a philosopher so he didn't pursue philosophical questions but he plumbed the depths of philosophical inquiry by uh, exploring and getting ever more deeply into what love relations are like for humans and dogs. And one of the things he brings out, by the way, and this is one of the differences between cats and dogs, is the jealousy of Queenie, of Achilles' human relationships. Hmm. In other words, Queenie's not jealous of Achilles' relationships with other dogs. I don't think he had any, at least not hmm. simultaneously. Uh, cats uh, object when other cats come into a human world that they inhabit and treat as their own. I don't think they give a toss about other humans unless they sense that the other humans are hostile to them. Otherwise, mm. they, do, they don't count. And that's a fundamental... By the way, on um, Wittgenstein, I did cite Wittgenstein to someone I knew for some years who kept lions in a very humane, out-of-doors way for... 30 years. And he said, well, he obviously, that bugger knew nothing about lions. <laughs> and that was, it was just ignorance that led Wittgenstein to say that, or rather a theory, as we'll say, a theory yeah. of, what well, language, of what language must be. So there couldn't be a counterexample for Wittgenstein because then it wouldn't, you say, but, you know, what about this? He communicates all the time with the lions. Ah, oh, well, that's not language. There was a marvellous uh, video that went viral a couple of years ago of this couple uh, from London who had adopted, it, it, you know, being the 60s, had acquired a lion cub, a, mm. uh, a female lion cub, and then grew up with them. Mm. 
and obviously became a bit of a handful. Mm. So these guys, there were a gay couple, took the took the lioness, uh, I think to Kenya or wherever that woman Joy Adamson had mm. her, her lion reserve and released the lion into the wild. And there's a marvelous video of them going back to visit the lion like mm. 15 years later, mm. getting out of the jeep. Mm. And this lioness, this fully grown lioness. I see the video. It's shot, incredible. Yeah. yeah incredible. Hugging them, embracing yeah, them, yeah. running across and leaping up on them and embracing these humans. And not it's harming true. them. No, not at all. Of course not. No, I mean, dogs are really part of the family. They just are. And, you know, when my partner uh, and I started living together more because of the pandemic, she started seeing a lot more of the dog. And eventually they fell in love with each other with a deep and passionate love and really intensely. And uh, they're together. They've gone into another room together now. And I am very jealous. <laughs> and, you, you sit, and I'm jealous of both of them. Here's yeah. the interesting thing. So it's back to John's point about in a strange way, he wants to claim cats as teaching something about human love relations, uh, instructing us. But I actually think the dog does it too. Yes, uh, yes. By arousing us to this capability yeah. we have for jealousy in that mm. way, both of the non-human mm. and the human, mm. they again draw our attention to the ridiculous nature of speciesism. Mm. Well, they're both, neither of them, cats or dogs, aim to do this or want to do this or perhaps even care that they're doing it. But they're both tremendous aids to human self-knowledge. Yes, well, I mean, I, I emailed uh, when we were setting up the debate mm. saying, talking about McGlorian and saying, you know, like dogs of his age, mm. he is still relentlessly mm. involved in politics. Because dog, <laughs> you know, which, is, which is a big mistake for anybody who's Absolutely. getting on, well, but particularly for dogs. Yes. Well, let, let, me, let me ask you both about politics. I did notice that during the recent US election, much fanfare was made over the fact that Biden will be bringing dogs. And I think cats mm. back to the White House and that the fact that President Trump didn't have pets was taken as indicative of something. Could, could that be right? Not the lack of pets are having an antipathy? It's a bad sign. Dogs? It's a bad sign. Uh, um, it may not be conclusive, though it didn't need to be in his case, but it's a bad sign because it means he's more interested in himself and he doesn't think he has anything to learn either from other human beings, but still less from non-human beings. And that's what it means. So to me, it was a bad sign. Uh, um, I don't know whether it was true that the Blairs didn't like the number 10 cat. I don't know if that was true or not. I believe um, it. Yeah, he was probably, uh, you know, agreeing with with George W. Bush to go into Iraq, uh, mm. you know, and cause untold suffering yeah. the same day that he was hating Humphrey, the Downing Street cat. Well, see. the bad thing about cats from a Blairite point of view is that they're not interested in progress. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're very content with the life they have and if they could understand progress i mean one of the things i imagine is what would a feline philosopher a cat with the intellectual powers of a, of a human but otherwise a cat mm. would be very i think very skeptical about progress <laughs> mm. Let's um, make some progress ourselves. Uh, the final vote uh, draws very mm. close, gentlemen. So let's hear our debaters close their arguments. I think you have one to two minutes each. John, do you want to speak for cats first? Yes, I mean, I'll just repeat what I've said. It's not a new argument. It's that um, they're not superior to dogs. People who love cats and don't love dogs so much are not superior to dog lovers. It's not about superiority or any kind of hierarchy. It's that cats can give something to our lives that dogs can't give because dogs are too close to us, too bonded, too adapted to our, our souls and our ways of life to give what cats can do. Cats can live with us intimately and yet be utterly different from us so that when we do interact, it's a miracle. Will, your closing argument for dogs. Yes, we're in it together. We're in the shit together. And, and their great advantage is that they will stay in it with us. And, uh, you know, I, I, I said I wouldn't resort to this argument, but I will. <laughs> I mean, nothing if not contrary. Um, uh, I used to be very friendly with uh, the notorious ex-gangster and, and bank robber John McVicker, who was at one time Britain's most wanted man after a jailbreak 
uh, from Wakefield, a special unit that had pretty much been constructed in order to imprison him because he'd caused such trouble in, in the prison system. And he, he once, uh, he had, John had a, a little terrier that he, he got from his mum called Clem. And he loved Clem very much, this little terrier. And he once said to me, you know what, Will? I think if during my youth, when I'd been in all that trouble, and particularly when I was in prison, I think if I'd had Clem, I wouldn't have caused any trouble at all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note, it's now time for you, our glorious audience, to make your final vote on the motion, cats versus dog. You should see the slide now on the screen. Uh, please vote cat or dog, or undecided if you're still, after all of this, a hamster person. Uh, if this feels all rather final and dramatic, then let me reassure you that this is all in good fun and neither cats nor dogs will be harmed as a result of this poll. In fact, they'll probably be petted a little bit more. While we're waiting for the votes to come in and be counted, it's sort of like the state of Georgia all over again, um, let me ask our debaters one final question. Um, I'm sure you've both heard of the sports term goat, greatest of all time, but is there a goat of cats or a goat of dogs? Who's the greatest cat of all time, John? Oh, well, an answerable question because they don't any hierarchies they form themselves are very fluid and very temporary and, and practical otherwise they just pursue their own i have a question for shedi you said you would tell us which oh, you I are know. i mm. i i am uh, uh i have to tell will that there are lots of muslims who love dogs and mm. you're right that the cultural antipathy to it means that it's a love that dare not speak its name very often but i admit that i am wild about cats but I have been very impartial in this debate, I think. You have, yes, you have. Um, mm. Yeah. Uh, mm. Will, who's your greatest cat, uh, your greatest dog of all time? Well, my greatest cat was my cat Spike, who I loved despite the fact that he not only killed birds, he used to rip their wings off and herd them into the garage where they would kind of keep them captive. Impressive behaviour. Very big, beautiful tabby. But, of course, the greatest dog of all time is my Jack Russell McGlorian. Who, because I, I love him. It's as simple as that. That would like... also be true of me. Uh, the, the greatest one for me was probably Sophie, one of the Burmese I had, who died at the age of 13. Ah, oh, uh, who can uh, argue with those examples? Uh, shall we see if our final vote, our results has come in? Are we ready? Oh, wow. OK, we're ready. Uh, votes are in and we can declare an animal king oh, or queen. Uh, a reminder that the result of the first vote was cats 34%, dogs 48%, undecided slash hamster 17%. So we started with dogs leading. And the final count is <laughs> cats 47%, dogs 49%, undecided oh. three. Wow. So, John, you clawed back quite a lot yes. there, pun intended. Yes, it's very, very close. close. It's very yeah. close. A whisker between you, 47, <laughs> 49. Um, so commiserations, John, but it was a very close run thing. And Will, you're like a dog with two tails today. Um, thank am. you so much to Will Thank Selfman, you, Will. John thank Gray. You, John. A reminder that you can purchase a discounted copy of John Gray's Feline Philosophy by clicking on the link in the audience chat. Thank you too to you, our audience. You've been totally delightful. Um, I'm sorry that your pets couldn't be involved as well. Um, and, and to Intelligence Squared, thank you for hosting us this evening. And I'm going to hand over back to Hannah Kay. Thank you so much, John and Will. That was such a terrific debate. I was laughing, crying. It was just wonderful. Um, I have to declare myself, I am a dog lover and I really can't believe looking at the, the vote here that it was so close. Um, all credit to you, John. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll have you back. We'll do bears versus hamsters, well, whatever you want to do. Um, anyway, I'd just like to remind you all, all, all you who are watching, um, that all the books we feature um, during this year at Intelligence Square are available at a discount um, under the shop tab on our website. Um, thank you so much for watching, and from me and all of us at Intelligence Squared, have a lovely evening. Good night. Thank you.